Hello, I'm Nat Price, uh, and with Steve Freeman, I wrote the book Growing Object Oriented Software Guided by Tests. But we've also started working with some colleagues on a hardware based startup uh, building peripherals for the Raspberry Pi. And this talk is about the painful lessons that we learn as software developers uh, entering the world of hardware based product development and the mistakes we made along the way. I actually started very, very briefly on my first code was written on a, on a Manchester Atlas. But I really came to age, sort of started seriously in the sort of the early PC generation. And I started on a Spectrum. Um, and the thing about these, not that it was for these, was that, you know, stuff didn't work that well. So you did actually have to take them apart and plug things in and figure out drivers and stuff. And of course, in those days, you, you know, you had to do what you had to do. Um, so that there's a, a return to, a kind of a return to our roots, partly with this notion of, of machines being open enough to play with. Um, and also they, they, the notion of being able to tinker with stuff. And the, interest me, the, the reason it's, it's relevant for the Pi is that's the, the sort of the origin story of the Pi, is that um, Eben Upton, Eben? Eben. Anyway, what is name? his name is, who came up with this was an, is an admissions tutor in Cambridge University. And he'd noticed that over the sort of 10 years, that the kids who came in knew less and less before they, before they turned up. And he realized that it's because, over time, the only machines they had access to were shiny PCs, which are expensive, you can't mess with those, or games consoles, which, you, which are sealed. And they, they, they'd lost this sort of thing that they were doing at the school, the stuff they were doing at, at school, where they were allowed to play inside and break it. And so a lot of the motivation for this is to have an open system that's cheap enough, it's what, 25, 30 quid, which is, I don't know, cheap, anyway. Um, <laughs> cheap enough to be almost disposable. And so the kids can play with it and they don't, you know, they're not going to get into trouble. And you can have a bucket of them in the corner of the classroom and whatever. Um, personally, the other thing for me was to learn some new stuff, because this is part of being the, after a while of being corporate deadwood. <laughs> Going a bit, going a bit, sort of going off, going a bit stale. So for me, it's it's you know I know this is old stuff, but for me it, it's all new to me. Um, and the other part was to explore some areas we can't do in our day jobs, like API, API design, design driver, de device drivers, which I don't know, a little bit of, and also product development. And then there is actually a, a sort of um, slightly more honourable. Um, motivation, which is to help grow the next generation of techies, geeks, whatever, um, and try and support what is turning into quite a, an interesting movement, certainly in the UK, to reform the catastrophe that is ICT education in schools. And there's, there's a lot of work being done on that area, so we want to put our little bit in. So, our harbour. This is actually real, we're not making this up. <laughs> so when we started, um, again it was, it was Ronnie's idea, um, at, the pie hadn't really come out, it was still sort of a, a gleam and they were having big big production problems because uh, it turned into a massive success. So we were messing around with the Arduino, and this is a um, legal board, and the, the difference is interesting because the Arduino really is just an embedded device, it doesn't really have an operating system and stuff, and it's very easy to get started, um, and uh, you can get small ones which are really, really cheap. Um, and it's a great thing to play with because it's so simple. Um, but there are limits to what you can sensibly program on it unless you get very clever. Whereas this, like the BeagleBoard, is a full-scale Unix device, um, but it's not very forgiving, and particularly it doesn't have uh, it doesn't have video output, which the, the Pi does, um, and it's quite expensive in comparison. It's about sixty quid. Yeah, sixty seventy pounds. Which is a, well, about sixty seventy euros. <coughs> so. so here's the Pi which has, um, and this sort of turned up in the middle of all of this, um, and sort of we sort of switched across to it. And it's got things like Ethernet, Ethernet USB, one of those is, um, uh, HDMI out, so you can just plug it in use its computer, and then audio and video. And then pins, IO pins across the top, which is part of this <coughs> thing about being an open platform. 
Um, it's very cheap. It's a um, 700 megahertz ARM processor, which you can now clock up to a gig. And four, four gig of RAM, I think. It's, so anyway, this, this is two to, two to three orders of magnitude more powerful than the work I did my PhD on. <laughs> and it's 30 quid on the... You know. oh. Anyway, so the, there are kind of two aspects to it. The one is, because it's actually, it's about equivalent to a small netbook in terms of performance. So you can just use it, lots of people just use it as a cheap laptop, or a cheap desktop, you know, and just put it into the telly, you know, and keyboard and mouse, you buy these kits, just put it all together, and just use it as a really cheap computer that's a bit more accessible than your average games console. A lot of people use it for media center, PVR, things like that, Yeah, using XBMC. And there are guys from doing some fantastic stuff with it, there's a QT group who are doing, you know, full scale, high definition video, and fancy graphics, and all kinds of stuff. Um, and that's fine. And lots of kids are using, do, developing things in Scratch, which is a, this graphical uh, friendly environment. But it's also got this other aspect, which is you can plug pins into it. Um, and one of the aspects about that is, is one of the ways they kept the cost down is it's not very safe in that respect. You can actually blow, the, blow your heart if you plug the wrong things into the pins. And so that's kind of like the motivation for uh, some of the stuff we're doing. Uh, the other thing to point out is it's not a hardcore embedded platform. You know, this is not serious, real time, making robots fly kind of stuff. Um, although you probably could if you wanted to. So what we have is is that these these sort of different um, um, I/O pins across the top there, um, but it's a bit a little bit painful to get to, and like I said, they're not protected. Um, so this is a little general post IO. These are a couple of serial um, uh, serial protocols, whatever, and then just a regular serial IO. Um, and this is our first cut of this, this board, which is you see here. So we just kind of extracted out all the, uh, all the different connectors. And then there's a bit of safety in here, so you want you know, resistance and no dies or things. So if you plug it in all wrong, it doesn't matter. Um, and then useful things like the button and then LED. Everything is LEDs. And then the sort of helpful power um, if you want to drive little devices and things. So basically, just to make the Pi easier to work with, if you want to, uh, yeah. Could you briefly explain what the acronyms mean? Not very well. <laughs> <laughs> General purpose I.O., I think, is... So those are pins, digital pins that you can either set high yeah. or low yeah. from software. In yeah. output or input. Yeah. Uh, I squared C or I two C is is inter integrated circuit bus. So it's a serial bus where you can address uh, up to two hundred and fifty five different chips on a very simple serial mm. bu uh, bus. Doesn't go very fast. Yeah. Whereas well, SPI, which is serial peripheral interface, mm. is a faster bus. But uh, unlike ITC, where you address the chips by uh, address, by sending a byte to say which chip you want to talk to, with SPI, you have chip select lines coming out. So you have a number of lines going out to each chip, and then you will raise one of them high, and that chip will start listening to the bus, which means you're limited by the number of lines that you can bring out. And the Raspberry Pi can only bring out two SPI lines. So that limits you to have two high-speed serial devices that you plug into. And then serial is good old-fashioned serial. You can only have one thing plugged into it. Yeah. Um, and things like, so on the original, um, actually, um, give it up. Never mind. Press this one. Mm. Or you want to go back? I want to try and go back. But anyway, on the original, um, you just get these sort of, you know, the pins are exposed. But we sort of gather <coughs> them together and then you get, you know, each of, each of these connectors includes a, a ground and power and all useful stuff. So you can just plug your connector into it and it's easier. So it's you know it's just helping out a little bit. Um, what does the button do? It's just a useful button that, that you can with these um, jumpers you can decide whether to connect it up to a GPIO. Similarly for the uh, the LED. So it's got appropriate pull up or pull down resistors, and the LED's got an appropriate resistor to limit the current going through the Pi, because if you don't, you'll end up drawing too much current through the Pi and can damage the circuitry. So it's just you can quickly get some flashing light and some button input without having to actually do any wiring up with a breadboard or something. 
the, the thing to remember about all this stuff is, is that basically what most people do, they get it home and they get an LED flashing. Yeah. And then they put it in the cupboard. <laughs> <laughs> so I did for several months until, yeah. Um, and then obviously there's a lot of people active in the space, you know, huge, huge things, a whole bunch of different um, people doing this. There's a couple that sort of the most, there's a couple that we've seen recently. One is called the Gert Board. It's a chap in the Netherlands, I think. Um, and, and his is more, he's a bit more hardcore than us. So he's, it's, it's a bit less, well, the, I, I guess you, you get a bit more lower level access, but it's a bit less helpful. Yeah. And then there's another interesting one that we've seen coming out of um, Manchester University called PyFace, which again is perhaps is a bit more closed and a bit safer. And they've got nice ideas. They've, they've got um, screw terminals, which makes it really easy to work with. But we didn't get that far. So that's the basic. And then the other bit we've been messing with. So this is this, this is a more recent uh, version of it, um, which Nat will talk over in a bit. Um, and this is a this is the SPI interface, and we've got a little port extender board, which we've got some examples down there. And so the other idea is you can get 16 connectors. You can think of 16 things to plug into, and then these these are the ones that can be daisy chained. So that's kind of like as far as we've got with the, the hardware. It's, it's and for, for certainly for us, it's been a learning experience. Learning experience, yes. indeed. Think. So before I do that, I should prove that this works. I'm not sure everybody will see this. <coughs> well, while you start going, I'll have a chat about the software. So while our hardware gurus were right, designing the hardware, and while we were waiting for the Pi, because I guess anyone who knows a Pi, when they announced it, everyone immediately snapped up the small run that they did, and then everyone else had to wait for months before they could get hold of one. Now they are more readily available, but they were. Uh, Surprising, you know, surprising to the people who produced them, surprisingly popular, everyone wanted one. They sold out almost instantly. So we couldn't get a Pi immediately. So we started off with Beagle Bones that have very similar uh, capabilities and also have a Unix API to it. So the Unix user level APIs were almost the same. So we were developing our APIs on Beagle Bones. And then when the Pi came out, we started working on the Pi, but we still didn't have our boards because they were going through many iterations. So we had, uh, we basically had some, some some early prototypes soldered up with variables and we were using breadboards while we were developing our software. Just to interrupt for a moment. I've got this all going. Just to point out, you can't actually see it. There's a flashing... Flashing LEDs. Flashing LEDs. <laughs> That's it. Um, <coughs> these two are going off... Um, this is sort of wrapping round and round. This is randomised. This is the sort of thing that's extremely difficult to do on the Arduino. Uh, because it's just an event loop, whereas I'm running, we're running these as separate processes. Um, and these are all daisy chained along, so this is the I2C, and they're not doing very much. And then this is just a similar sort of thing on the SPI, just to prove that we can. So it's just evidence. And then our big red button is also tapped onto the uh, I2C bus. Um, so that's just what we can. Right, off you go. So yeah, so we designed the software while waiting for the hardware. We had um, a number of goals that we were trying to aim at with the API design. So we wanted it because we were aiming at sort of education initially and people wanting to learn this stuff. We wanted to keep it very simple. We wanted to uh, not hide the details of the hardware so that you know learning about the physical computing was as much learning about the way the hardware works, what ITC buses mean, and voltages and pull down resistors and things like that, as it is like just writing a nice API, um, or writing to a nice API. Um, at the same time though, having done some Arduino work, uh, one of the issues that we found was that the APIs on the Arduino for very similar things can be vastly different. So the, the API for writing uh, to GPIO, digital pin uh, setting values on the digital pins, it's very different if, you're, if the pin is on board than if it's at the end of an I2C bus where you have to use a different API. So we wanted some common abstractions for uh, hardware that was similar, even if it happened to be accessed over a different protocol. And we wanted to uh, embrace the fact that the Raspberry Pi is, uh, is a powerful little Linux computer. It's not a microprocessor, a microcontroller like the Arduino is. It, there's a lot of good stuff that can run on Linux that we want to use. So 
help from demons, other programs are running at the time, maybe GUIs, maybe web servers, um, uh, and we wanted to be able to use lots of the useful libraries that come with Linux and are available on many languages on Linux. Um, because it's Linux, and because we wanted maybe we were thinking put it into schools or people might be connecting this thing onto their network and just leaving it running, we wanted our software to be secure by default. So just follow good uh, Linux security practices. Um, and uh, for example, on the Pi by default, other libraries uh, make you have to run your program as root if it wants to access GPIO. And we didn't really want to do that. We wanted to limit the attack surface, um, probably not really worrying too much about, I don't know, mafia trying to hack our bank accounts, but maybe uh, you know school kids playing pranks or trying to hack exam database passwords or something. Um, just you know, better to be secure by default, and then we don't have to worry about this kind of thing. Fingers crossed. Um, and uh, as Steve mentioned, you know, hardware interfacing is basically a concurrency issue. You're dealing with events outside your computer and trying to juggle uh, reacting to all of these events. So we wanted to make some accessible concurrency. <coughs> Uh, abstractions that would allow people to easily handle the concurrency aspect, which is quite tricky in, say, the Arduino. Once you get beyond a certain complexity, basically the API for the Arduino chucks a problem at you and you have to try and deal with it with building your own object models and what have you, and we'd hopefully provide something that makes that a bit easier. So, so these are kind of contradictory goals. Um, how do we make something very efficient for hardware access and at the same time embrace all the Linuxy goodness. And we can't write an API for everything. So we're going to plant our flag in the ground and say what we're aiming at is an API for sort of making your Raspberry Pi join the Internet of Things, maybe do sensing and publishing to the Internet and interacting with the Internet and connecting the Internet to physical devices, rather than something like robotics. So we're not... Uh, optimizing for speed and raw access to the devices and real-time uh, response, which might be necessary for robotics. We're tending towards safety and security and ease of use for allowing you to quickly knock things up and connect them to the internet. So looking at the software space around uh, physical computing, there's a lot of options. Which one? How do we start? There's a lot of languages out there that are already available and very popular. Um, you know, do we pick the Arduino model? Didn't really think that worked very well on a Linux platform because it's based on a, on a constant sort of like busy loop. Um, although people have ported it, um, you know, it's, it's not ideal for fitting into the larger sort of Linux ecosystem. Uh, Scratch is very popular with education. Uh, Ruby is very popular with kids. Node.js is very popular with cool kids. Um, uh, <laughs> Haskell is well, you know, everything you should always mention Haskell because they've already done it probably. Um, and Python, well basically the, the decision was largely made for us because the Raspberry Pi Foundation said that the educational distribution of the Raspberry Pi is going to use Python as its language for their education. So then it comes down to, do you want Python 2 or Python 3? Which is, whenever you do anything in Python, that's the big question. Um, and basically we've gone for Python 3 because Python 2 has just got too much legacy cruft. We're thinking if we are writing tutorials for people who've never really programmed before? Do we really want to be explaining about the difference between new and old style classes and how it doesn't work unless you put particular things in your class? And just like, you know, there's lots and lots of legacy cruft in Python 2. And this is an example that I spent a day debugging. Um, in, if you, you say bytes and give it a sequence of byte values, in Python 3, you get a byte buffer with that sequence of byte values in it. And in Python 2, you get that byte buffer, which is not what you expect at all. Um, there is a reason for that, and it's a reason I don't want to have to explain to new people who are completely new to programming, coming to our you know, forums and saying, like, why is this not working, and then having to debug that. So our overall structure, then, is a Python API uh, class library, very Pythonic, very traditional, uh, in user space. So no device drivers, but abstractions that would allow us to put device drivers in if we decide we ever need to do that. Um, so uh, on the GPIO side, we have a pin abstraction where you can just set the value of the pin or the direction of the pin, and the, the pin basically has some properties, and it just happens to go and get those from the from the the, pin, the actual GPIO pin on the device when you actually want to read or write them. Um, and then uh, abstractions for talking the I2C or SPI protocols. So I2C master is used 
on the master side of the protocol to talk to particular slave devices, um, and an SPI device represents one of the two SPI devices on a Raspberry Pi. And then above the I2C layer, we have uh, abstractions for the particular chips on the boards that we're producing, our expanded boards, like these are uh, MCP23017 uh, chips, and they basically provide more GPIO pins to the device, but you access them over an I2C bus. So we model the chip uh, with an API that's split into two, one of which exposes the details of how the chip actually works. So you can actually use uh, MCP23017, basically exposes all the registers it used to configure the pins and, and query the values. So it exposes all of those using all the names that you would see in the data sheet if you actually downloaded the data sheet from the manufacturer. So you could just use that to use the API to drive the devices. And then we build another abstraction using that, which then gives you the, the common abstractions for GPIO pins, which will be the same as the ones that is used by the GPIO classes. So we've got a common abstraction for onboard and offboard GPIO. But we are exposing some of the details. If you need to, you can drop down and see how it all works and how it all fits together. And then off to the side, we have a little set ID, a set UID C program that provides safe access to the onboard pin so you don't have to be root when you're running your Python code. So you don't have to run an, an internet connected server, which could possibly be compromised or something, um, as root. You can run it in normal user space, so user permissions, and isolate it. And then it just uses a GPIO <coughs> program to basically take ownership of certain pins on the board and that program basically makes sure that different programs can't interfere with each other's pins. And here's an example. This is the program that is actually running this big red button. Uh, here we create an I2C master to actually access the, uh, the default uh, I2C bus on the Raspberry Pi. We create uh, a chip which is, we're dropping down to the chip level here for the using our MCP23017. Uh, and so we, we create some, uh, uh, the API to access the registers. We write certain registers using these obscure acronyms that we've taken from the, uh, from the data sheet. Uh, so we initialize it saying we want all the pins to be input, all the pins to use pull-up resistors, uh, which basically means that when we press a button, it pulls it down to ground. And then we say, and when it is pulled down to ground, report that as a one so that we can just treat it as a Boolean. So it was pressed, and we just read the registers. And if it isn't zero, obviously we're currently pressed. So we just detect when it has gone from not being pressed to being pressed. And then we basically fire a URL request at a web browser running or a web server running on the Raspberry Pi. And then just we continue polling in, that, in this particular example if we haven't wired up <coughs> interrupts. So quite simple, quite compact, very python -y. We're using sort of standard Python context manager uh, mechanism to manage all the resources, so it's you know, hopefully as simple as we can make it. So that's very Python-y. What we haven't really uh, talked about is, you know, so we want, also wanted to have accessible concurrency. We can run lots of programs at once, but actually we really want to be able to run lots of things at once and have them talk to one another. And we want to make that easy for people to do. So this is a really interesting paper I found. Uh, Common Sense Computing, Episode 3, Concurrency and Concert Tickets. It's a, an empirical study of people who have never done any programming before, uh, giving them a problem that is a, basically a concurrency problem, and seeing how well people who've never programmed can actually solve concurrency problems. Uh, and this is actually a repeat uh, of a study where they actually reproduced the findings. And what they found was that people who've never programmed before can actually solve concurrency problems without a problem. They can recognize them. They can come up with strategies that can solve them. My takeaway is that they solve concurrency problems in the problem domain. So hardware is a naturally concurrent problem domain. So it's quite easy for someone who doesn't really understand programming and might not understand why you need a monitor when you want to do current, you know, or a lock around concurrent access to two words at the same time. But they can understand how to, why the problem domain is a concurrency issue, and they solve it by message passing. So that's really interesting, and also I like writing concurrency code with message passing. So we're working on an API that will apply some of the ideas of PyCalculus uh, to uh, doing sort of Pythonic PyCalculus on the Raspberry Pi, basically, for doing hardware programming. So here's
Um, so here's a very uh, early uh, sort of iteration of the API. All our APIs are out on GitHub. Uh, this one isn't yet, but uh, certainly our, our Python API is, and people have been using it and commenting on it, and we've been slowly uh, tweaking the design of it as we as people tell us about it. And we'll do the same with this, the CV, find the time. Um, so here we, we can define types of tasks by just using a task decorator. So here's a task that's an LED, given a pin and an input channel, it will receive a value from the input channel and set the pin's value to that, and just continue to do that, waiting for a, something to set the pin to. Here's a task that toggles a value, so given a rate at which you want to set a value up or down, and an output channel, uh, it starts off as false and then continually sends the state and negates the state and sees for a little bit. And we can compose these tasks. This is the, I think, the beautiful uh, abstractions, the beautiful concepts behind the Pi calculus. Is that it's not just threads and monitors. It's, it, it creates a concurrency or process algebra in which you can build processes by composing processes, um, and they have very clearly understood semantics when you do so. So, to create something that blinks an LED, I create a channel. And then I have a parallel composition of toggling, which goes out, sends onto that channel, and an LED, which receives from that channel, and rise to the pin. So I've composed two processes to create a new process. And then my main program is for each of the pins, and for a random rate, I'll create an LED blinker for that pin. And then I'll have a list of them using some Pythonic uh, list comprehension. I'll run them all in parallel, and I'll run them as my main program. So you can, can quick, quickly plug together uh, pieces of concurrent behavior and compose them by me with message sending to build your sort of concurrency solution. Early days yet, and maybe people will hate it, who knows, but we're going to put it out there and see how well it works. Good. Yeah, just a couple of points of order in the middle of that. Um, <coughs> One of which is the name Pi in Raspberry Pi is not, a is not an accident, which is why we're working in Python, because that was part of the original plan. Um, and in case you didn't notice, we're actually served, this is actually a browser that's being served on the Mac, which is being served from a web server on the Pi, a little Python web server. And that's how the button is talking to it and all that. So we've got all that going as well. So. A couple of things to explain things. One is that all of a sudden we have to go physical. Uh, there's a picture of something physical. Oh, family. Yeah, there's a picture of something physical. Um, it's a bit of a, certainly for, for me, it's a bit of a, a change. Um, you know, because we get to live too much in our heads. And particularly if you're doing large sort of enterprise systems, is you never get to think about to deal with anything as low level as this. And you kind of forget that Beneath it all, there's some silicon, some electricity, and various other bits and pieces. Um, and just the kick from actually, that's actually soldered up, actually getting a soldering iron out for the first time in literally decades, and trying to make something that, that, that looks reasonable. Remembering things like, don't pick it up from the hot end. Um, <laughs> don't reach for things when you have the hot, when you have an iron in your hand, all that kind of stuff. It's just, um, it takes you somewhere else that, that uh, I haven't been for a while. Um, more conceptually, no. um, the other thing is, is you start to discover that, that physical objects behave differently from physical objects, not binary. They're not digital, perhaps is a better word. You get stuff that looks right but doesn't work because, I don't know, there's a dry solder joint. Um, you can't rely on, you have to be a lot more careful because you can't rely on the stuff, particularly when you're assembling things yourself, you can't rely on stuff actually working. Um, and you get, this weird, you get side effects, like um, this morning, or was it last night, while we're trying to get this thing to work, we reinvented the theremin. You didn't really know about the theremin. It's the, it's the instrument you've played by moving, you pick up your, moving your hand up and down. Yeah. So we re reinvented one of those this morning, last night, which is why we had to, had to redo it. But it's stuff that, that in my normal day-to-day, -day, I just don't get to see. Um, things like... Um, Different manufacturers, you, you send off a spec for a board like this to different manufacturers, it comes back different. You know, it's not, um, we, we, 
one of our colleagues found a very nice um, manufacturer with a very nice colour. We came back and the pins, the holes are too small because they use a different something or other. So we've got these boards we can't use, except except for uh, I don't know, coffee coasters or something. Um, and the other thing about this is, is that you can actually break the hardware. Um, so if you plug, you know, if you plug a lot, plug your mains power into one of these things, then it will blow up. And there are more subtle things you can do to sort of degrade the circuits. Um, and that tends to mean that, that some of your decisions are a bit more irreversible, and you have to move a little bit more carefully. So a nice example of that. So this is this is this this board that I made up, one of my first major attempts. And it's not obvious that that diode is the wrong way around. And uh, take unsoldering it and putting it back together again, putting it back the right way around, is a right pain. You just don't want to do that more than. And similarly, on one of these these little um, IQC boards, the first time I did that, I put the socket in the wrong way around. It's to be a habit. And you know, when you've soldered eight of these, and you realise it's the wrong way around. That's too much trouble. <laughs> So you learn to be a lot more careful and perhaps a little less refactoring is harder. It's not impossible, but it's just harder. Um, How did you find out that the diode was the wrong way around? Other than looking at it? I can't remember actually. We were, I think I was trying to connect to it or something and, and stuff just wasn't happening. And, and I suddenly noticed that this was this suddenly looked a bit different. It took a while, it took, it took a, a while because I wasn't using it very much. But that's a, that's a nice example. So one of the other things is because now you're working across the hardware software boundary, at least I you know, need to me. Um, and so you're debugging away and your code just won't work. What's wrong with this code? This code is perfect. What's wrong with it? Oh, my diode's the wrong way around. <laughs> and vice versa. So it, it, it sort of does spread your, uh, spread your skills. Um, right. Press the big red button. Oh, yes. The other thing is you have to get organized. Um, so it does it does get a bit messy. This is the area of a colleague of ours, Joe Walls, who is just, I don't know where he finds the time. He actually built the whole thing, as well as all the stuff he built and the software he writes and stuff. He just, I don't think he sleeps. <laughs> it's the only explanation I can think of. Um, but because you, you find there's a lot, you end up with lots of little bits and pieces. And then the last thing you want to do, you need stock. So the last thing you want to be, you're in the middle of one of these and you run out of resistors or something, something like that. These are all on the web, by the way. If you don't. Um, you've got a whole thing of all, all the useful things he did that he picked up. Or, you know, run out of run out of cables. The last thing you want to have to do is go down the shops because you forgot you just run out of cables. So you need stock. Um, so this is, this is the ideal. What's more realistic is... Romilly's desk, <laughs> and mine is like this, but, but a bit smaller. The other thing is you do need a good iron. It's uh, it's not worth if you're going to do any more than a minimum. Uh, it's worth getting a proper iron that gets hot enough with a proper uh, temperature control. Uh, right, that's that bit. So I think one of the things that we found that actually what surprised me certainly was that even designing bare boards there's still a significant usability component. You can have a look at an early... So what we found early on, this is one of our early iterations of the board. Um, that is this one. Right, and, and yeah, we've designed this to daisy chain, to allow you to... to we were going to produce all these different uh, add-on boards, and we will, uh, where this is our first one, and, and we can just daisy chain them all up, and, and it's great, until we realise, hmm, this daisy chain, when you take it out, just crosses a whole bunch of these connectors. Um, and also, the boards you just produce when you daisy chain them up, they cross the GPIO connectors, which is the very thing that they're designed for. Ah, we've been so concentrating on the schematics, on the PCB layout, uh, on how to deal with the manufacturers, uh, and like uh, design, our, check our designs against their design rules, all of this. We haven't really focused on what do these things physically look like, how are people actually going to use them when they've got them in their hands and they've got them next to their Raspberry Pi. And so, you know. We have this suddenly this, this problem that we want to do um, uh, a sort of you know, usability style uh, you know, user experience iteration, but we've got hardware which takes a very long time uh, to do these iterations on. What we were finding was that we would find one of these issues, 
or, or maybe just a floor, <coughs> and then you've got either, you can get like a PCB fab done overnight if you're willing to pay a huge amount of money, uh, or you ship it away, maybe two to three weeks later, so it'll come back to your door and you've got like another 10 boards, and then you find another issue with it. So usability sort of iteration, in software, you'd normally sit down with the user and they'd go, oh, can you put like the button over there, or make that a different color, make that bigger, or maybe move the screens around, and you can iterate very quickly around the usability of your product. Not, not with hardware. Um, yeah, on one, one time we sent uh, a load of boards off to a manufacturer in Bulgaria and they went on holiday for a month. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we've decided we, we, we have to change the way we produce these boards and think about the physical user experience of them much earlier on in the process. So, we're going to do some paper prototyping of our boards. When we get to the next board design, we're going to be made basically thinking about the physical structure of an in cardboard and playing around with it before we actually start working on the schematics. Um, we started basically... Yeah. Ah, so that's, yeah, our latest design. You can see we've iterated uh, quite a lot. We now don't overlap. We've got rounded corners so it's not scratchy in your hand as you're sort of plugging these things in. Uh, a lot of things that you don't really think about when you're focusing in on the electronics and the actual PCB layout and the schematics. So before we leave it, this is as it turned up. <coughs> this isn't. This is the one before this one because actually, as it arrived, this thing was the wrong way round, which meant that you'd have to put this over there. And it's just endless. <coughs> so what we've started doing is actually sketching out ideas for future board <coughs> designs uh, on, on paper and emailing them around and. And, and much earlier thinking about what are these, these things going to look like when they're actually built. Uh, we're using just paper and scanners. I use paper, which is a program on the iPad called Paper, confusingly. Um, and we, you know, maybe our ideas get a bit fanciful. Um, but you know, this is basically, we, we, we've realized we just have to address this whole uh, usability problem of the, the physical usability of these things earlier on in the process. So, yeah, we started this trying to take some of these lean startup ideas and, and, and build our startup that way. But the, the, the slow sort of uh, feedback loop you have with hardware products has made that actually very difficult. So we've kind of uh, fallen back to some uh, older uh, techniques, really. We started off with focus groups. Um, we've uh, gone to open source hardware and Raspberry Pi user groups and talk to people and to find out what people actually want out of these products. And then uh, Romley started a newsletter where people have to sign up to the newsletter and show some interest and some engagement with the product um, and, and agreed to answer some questions that we might send out in the newsletter. And we've had some real success with the newsletter actually finding out what it is that people want out of these things. People are really interested. Um, uh, even before the product is out, has shown interest and are happy to engage with us and answer our questions. Here's our growth uh, over over uh, from March to August to this year. We've gone up to about a thousand people on our mailing list. Um, we sent out um, uh, questionnaires, and we see that when we ever when we send one out, we get like a 73.5% opening, which is about three times the industry average. And our click-through is about 10 times the industry average. That's someone who's like opened up the newsletter, read it, interested in it, clicked through to the question and wanted to answer some questions about the products we we're producing. So we've got real buy-in to that um, through this process. And, and that's what really actually opened our eyes and showed us that um, you know, uh, there's this huge market of silver soldiers. And it's maybe not, uh, maybe you know, before we actually try and push things into schools, you know, and, and try and uh, build products and tutorials and documentation for people who want to teach using these things. There's a huge market of people who just want to learn using these things. Um, and and, uh, and, and we, we're sort of like trying to now uh, meet their needs as well. Okay. So again, if you're, uh, if you're used to this, this is all kind of obvious. Um, official team, just make a point. Um, but there's now this, this, certainly in our world, there's this big division between software people and hardware people. And it's much harder compared to what we're used to, to just sort of the whole T-shaped thing, just stepping in where you happen to be needed, because we, we just don't have the history, we don't have the skills. Um, so you have to manage that um, a lot more carefully. 
But one thing we can do is we can represent the naive users. And so we can have a, a sort of a discussion in, inside about how the experience of using this stuff rather than um, without the built-in assumptions and tacit knowledge of the people who are working on the boards. The other thing is, is that was we probably ought to have known, but was surprising, <coughs> is just how much slower it is to do this thing with a distributed team than a, a distributed hardware team than a distributed software team. Because one of my guys lives in France <coughs> at the end of a not very good connection. And Romley lives an hour's bus ride away from where I am, so it's a, it's a little bit of an effort to get there. And the things that make it work is when you get a new board in, you just send a copy to everyone. Everybody gets copies. Um, and things like nowadays, you get good, really easy video conferencing. So you have to have the, you know, the, the Skype or the the, um, the meetup stuff. So you can actually with good cameras, so you can hold up the board and say, "What about this button? Is that what you meant to do?" And it's it's not great, but it's a way of coping. So, just to finish, this is the great thing. It's freedom, freedom to tinker. And this is the, the motivational bit. There you go. This picture is actually its actually an advertisement from a furniture company saying, wouldn't you like your office to look like this? <laughs> <laughs> terrifying. Um, yeah, it's just you and the machine. There's no, you know, third part, no or internal organization that's trying to stop you getting access to the machine, saying, no, you can't have that. We're actually mm -hmm. moving to virtual this year, and da 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 da. It's just you and this little bit of silicon down here. Um, which is a much more entertaining, satisfying feedback loop than submitting a form and waiting three weeks. Um, and it's surprisingly easy, right? The, and that, the, the main people, thing yeah. is it's easy. The people have written the uh, you know, Linux drivers and got little work on the pipe, done a fantastic job. It's so easy just to pick it up, hook it up, you know, learn some basic electronics and make something happen. Um, and it's a really satisfying feeling compared to just... Yeah. You know, does taking it, a grid of data out of a database and putting it in a grid on the screen and then taking some grid of data out of a screen and putting it back in the database. Yeah, there's, and there's a huge amount of stuff out there now and, and growing. And this is, I think, if you're going to do anything sort of more than sort of beginners, it's actually a bit easier to work with than, say, the Arduino, because, for me, anyway, from my, from my point of view, because we're used to Linux and, or Unix and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it, it's... You know, you, you get you get to sort of stretch, you know, stretch a bit. Re either learn or relearn new disciplines. We keep bumping into people that used to do this, you know, a long time ago, and that's only just and are coming back to it. Um, so you get to resurrect some old skills um, and discover new worlds of head-smacking mistakes, like the soldering your connectors on or diodes the wrong way around. Um, and there's lots of community stuff out there. Um, the uh, the Raspberry Pi meetups are called Raspberry Jams, of course. <laughs> so there's a, there's a, all the puns are rapidly being taken up. So uh, there's, a, there's a shortage of puns in this world. Um, and so basically, the short message is, go for it. Uh, and that's it. Thank you.